Welcome to the Coronavirus Diaries with me, Vasilis Katsardis. Today I have the pleasure to interview Andrew Nielsen, who is um, a judicial system expert, I would say, in the UK. And we will talk a little bit about what's happening during the coronavirus pandemic in prisons, mainly in the UK, but also in Europe and the US. Uh, Andrew, thank you very much for coming to the show. Thank you for inviting me. So let's start with uh, what you know best, which is what's happening right now in Great Britain. Can you tell me what have been the measures taken by the government uh, in order to not uh, have many, many problems with the pandemic in prisons in uh, Britain? Yeah, I mean, the uh, the government here has been um, quite slow to act, it has to be said. Um, and I, I, by that, I mean primarily that uh, we have an overcrowded prison system in England and Wales. Um, so there are, as of today, there are just over 81,000 prisoners. Um, and those prisons as a, are, are themselves overcrowded. So there are more prisoners held within them than they were designed to hold. Um, we know about 70% of prisons in England and Wales are overcrowded. So that's 84 of the 121 prisons. And that means that near, nearly 19,000 prisoners are sharing cells. And we know from public health experts that overcrowded, uh, what they call congregate settings, um, such as prisons or hospitals, or even chalet camps, as we saw at the beginning of the virus, um, can act as um, pumps for the virus, actually spreading the infection within that community, but then out of that community. Um, so the need to reduce the prison population when you have an overcrowded system like ours is pretty, uh, is pretty vital. Um, but so far, uh, the government has dragged its feet. So it did make an announcement that it would look to release up to 4,000 prisoners early uh, but only a handful, um, somewhere between 25 and 50, have so far actually been released under coronavirus measures. And we're aware, because it was put out into the public domain, that the private Public Health England advice that the UK government received was suggesting to them that they would have to reduce the prison population by something like 15,000 to get rid of overcrowding and, and make it much easier for prisoners to self-isolate and staff to maintain social distance too. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I've read that um, prisoners who were supposed to be released two months later were supposed to be released now in the UK, while in France, for example, uh, this is considered a small margin and they're doing it in also an overpopulated prison uh, system, of course, of inmates. Six months, they're giving six months. Whoever is supposed to uh, be released in six months' time is being released now. Uh, if, is that true? And if yes, uh, what is your comment on that? Yeah, so that's the 4,000 figure that I, I mentioned. That would be people who come within this two-month uh, package. There is also... Um, some advice that's actually just come out today, uh, allowing people to be temporarily released on compassionate grounds. Um, the main um, criteria for that is pregnant women. There are only a handful of them in the system. Um, and people who would be considered extremely vulnerable to the virus. Um, now, it's a very much it's left in governor's, prison governor's discretion whether those people would be released. But that would mean possibly another up to 2,000 prisoners who could be released on those compassionate grounds temporarily. If they're still serving their prison sentence when this is over, they'd be returned to prison. But you're right, that's um, pretty, pretty miserly uh, stuff compared to some other countries. And France is a good example. So, yeah, I mean, we would, we would imagine... Um, that um, they're looking, for example, I mean, to immediately, they, I think they've been trying to release 5,000 prisoners. And as I mentioned, that might sound comparable to us, but but we've only released a handful of those, you know, less than 50. 
Um, and they're also looking to bring down the entrance into the prison system uh, from something like, I think in France, it's an average of 200 per day to maybe about 30. Um, and we're aware of other countries uh, who have um, taken steps to um, make much more dramatic and faster uh, prison releases, including regimes uh, which are not necessarily associated with being uh, soft on crime, uh, you know, somewhere like a, a Iran. Um, and even in the United States, uh, again, a, a country probably, you know, by per capita, in fact, the largest prison population in the world, um, there are various states who've been releasing uh, hundreds of prisoners. Uh, and in California alone, we know that about three and a half thousand people were granted early release. Um, so we would like to see the government go further, not least here, because their own public health advice has been telling them to go further. Um, and really, that means getting rid of overcrowding in the system, uh, which would mean, as I say, about re reducing the population of just over 80,000 uh, to something like uh, 65,000. I'm getting the, the sense, let's say, that uh, prisons are and prisoners are considered secondary people, uh, like secondary citizens, and these measures were not taken uh, as fast as for the rest of the population, but by in this way, also the personnel is in danger or can be a threat. Absolutely. So, I mean, um, staffing, I mean, maybe I should run through some figures generally about, about both prisoners and staff so far. And these figures for England and Wales um, date, uh, the most recent figures we have are, are from Tuesday of this week, so the 21st of April. Um, and more prisoners had tested for COVID-19 across about 66 prisons. <clears throat> now, bear in mind, there's not a lot of testing going on in prisons. There's been a quite a lot of focus on the UK's lack of testing generally um, in the community. Um, 231 prison staff um, have been tested um, positive, uh, including, uh, no, sorry, not including, but in addition, about nine um, personnel who is, uh, transfer prisoners from prisons to prisons or from prisons to courts um, have also tested positive. Um, about 15, well, as of as of as of what I know today, 15 prisoners have died and five staff members, uh, including uh, a woman as young as 33. That, that's um, exactly my point uh, th about the staff personnel as well. Um, so it's not about infecting the prisoners. It's about the whole ecosystem being very problematic. Yeah. And I mean, I think the, the it's the, the impact on the prison system um, but also a sign of how it impacts on the community outside is is also how many um, staff are self-isolating. So staff who either because they themselves have symptoms that could be COVID-19 or they have family members who have COVID-19, um, they won't be going into work. Um, and we know there are about four and a half thousand staff in England and Wales are currently self-isolating. Now that means that the staffing levels of the prison system at the moment are at about 80% of what they should be. And we already had staffing issues in, in the UK because some years ago um, we saw cuts to staffing levels because of austerity measures. And the government, despite trying to recruit, has, um, and, and indeed um, starting to recruit more officers, has never managed to get back to those pre-austerity levels of staffing. The problem with not having enough staff is that um, it means that the regimes that the prisons are operating under um, are extremely, um, extremely Spartan. Um, and to give you a sense of that, um, because there are not enough staff to allow any kind of controlled movement of prisoners out of cells to classes, even if they're you know kept socially distant from each other, um, for classes, rehabilitative programs, but the sorts of things that people should be receiving while they're serving a sentence, if we want to, if we hope that they're not going to commit crime on release, um, that's just not happening. And so conditions are extremely challenging and prisoners are, are being locked up at the moment for 23 hours a day uh, with no education activities or support. 
They get one hour of, of not really even exercise as such because things like gymnasiums are closed because obviously um, they don't want people touching um, gym equipment and then potentially spreading the virus. So they're getting outside uh, for about an hour. Um, most of that will actually not be outside because it will take them quite a bit of that hour to get out of the prison and then back into their cells. Um, but that is it. So for the remainder of the day, 23 hours, uh, people are being expected to sit on a prison bunk, uh, by an open toilet, um, possibly sharing, you, you know, a cell with one or two other people um, for the for the whole of the day. And you know, an average cell in England and Wales is about the size of someone's, you know, the average person's bathroom in a flat. It is not a big a big space, particularly if you're sharing it with other people. And um, have you noticed that um, when somebody tests uh, positive or has signs of uh, COVID-19, uh, do prison systems react quickly uh, or they take their time, which could be problematic, more problematic than it already is, to be fair? Very diff it's difficult to tell, um, not least because of this issue around testing. Um, so anecdotally, we know that prisoners are being asked to self-isolate if they show any symptoms. Um, but they, but rather like actually people in, in the UK, in the community, uh, they're not going to get a test. Um, and they're only going to go to hospital uh, if they, um, they, they progress through the virus into, you know, severe pneumonia, um, you know, the, the sorts of problems that see people in intensive care and on ventilators. Um, beyond that, they're going to be asked to, 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 to stay in their cells and, and, and just suffer. Um, and and that, is, um, that is, I mean, uh, one of the other reasons why um, we are arguing uh, to the government um, that they have to reduce the prison population because there's very little in the way of support that these individuals are getting. Um, and if they are in the community, then they ha will have relatives, spouses, people who can just help them through this period. About um, the rest of Europe and how uh, prisoners are being treated during this uh, pandemia, um, would you have any comments uh, and any knowledge that you could share with us? Yeah, well, I mean, as I said um, earlier, there's evidence that countries like France um, are moving quicker than the UK on releasing prisoners. Um, we know that in the Netherlands, for example, um, they've stopped um, people being detained on uh, short sentences, um, short prison sentences um, at all uh, for, for the time being. Um, but I think that it is it it, it is a, a a patchy picture from country to country. There's not a coordinated um, effort around this, and it is very much up to individual governments to make political choices. Um, and that is, I think, clearly the you know the, we know in our own country that the, the the government concern about releasing prisoners is obviously that they may go on to commit further crimes. Um, but we think there are clear categories of prisoner uh, where that's very unlikely. They're deemed at low risk. People on short sentences um, don't commit serious crimes. That's why they're not being sent to prison for very long. Um, people who are on longer sentences but are towards the end, but not just two months um, of, their, of their sentence. Um, and, of course, we have quite a lot of elderly prisoners, about 1,800 over 70 in England and Wales. Um, and again, how likely are these elderly prisoners to reoffend, particularly as many of them are in prison for historic cases um, that, that were per prosecuted for, um, much later on? Um, what would you say to uh, the thought that some people have that people who haven't committed violent crimes, for example, tax thieves, should be released immediately, no matter how long they still have, so that we can immediately achieve the uh, 
uh, to end with the overpopulation of prisons. Uh, and by the way, I'm, I'm thinking now, even not having an overpopulation might be an issue during a pandemic. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I mean, there are, yeah, I mean, we, we, would, we would agree. Not, people who have not committed um, violent crime um, would be obvious candidates uh, for release at this time. There are multiple purposes to imprisoning people. And punishment is clearly the main one. I think there are also people on remand, lots of prisoners who um, haven't been sentenced for any crime, but they've been sent to custody while their case goes through the courts. Um, and again, they seem to be a very obvious group uh, that shouldn't shouldn't be being sent to prison at this time, um, not least because they may well be... Um, they may well be coming out quite quickly because they're on remand. Um, and if they don't get sentenced, but they go into the prison and pick up the virus while they're there, they then go out and they'll spread spread it, which is something we obviously want to avoid. And if I would uh, ask you to give me in, in little titles, one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, five, uh, what you're asking from uh the prison system in the uk or the prison systems in general now in this pandemic what would it be well we are asking that the prison population is urgently reduced uh to end overcrowding and prevent the spread of covid-19 in prisons that's safe that's to make the place safer for prisoners safer for staff but also safer for the wider community because prisons act as pumps of the virus out to uh, the community. Um, and we're asking the government to move further and faster on the initiatives that it's already brought um, so that it can not just reduce the amount of people at risk of catching the virus in prison and spreading it either in prison or in the community, but also so that prisons can be stabilised and social distancing measures can be introduced without that having to mean that prisoners spend 23 hours out of 24 uh, locked in a cell doing nothing. Because there is a huge amount, you know, we, we talk about the mental health um, impact on all of us from lockdown in the community. But in the UK, at least we get out for an hour of exercise. We can go to the shops if it's essential foods. We, we do get out of the house or the flat. Um, in, uh, in prison, that's not the case. Um, and the the mental distress of living in an environment where you know the virus is rampant um, and you're spending 23 hours a day on your own or sharing a cell with a stranger who may have the virus you don't know, uh, that, that that is a part of the problem that we, we suspect will come out after the virus that has been as almost as significant as the virus, that there will be deaths, um, suicides by prisoners, not directly related to COVID-19, but because of the situation that the virus has put the prisons in and the government's failure to properly respond. I know what we're talking about is a very serious issue, but I would like to end up with a, in a more jokey way. Uh, I had this idea and I wrote it the other day on Twitter that uh, people under house arrests are laughing at us now during the pandemic. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I mean we're all we're all prisoners in a way at the moment, um, and um, it's one of the reasons why I would hope that you know if the government did um, and governments generally look to release people from prison, that that actually perhaps the public might have more sympathy um, for why that's important and have more sympathy generally maybe going forward um, for what incarceration can do to someone mentally, um, and it might make it more real to people some of the arguments that we make generally about don't overuse prison because it damages people, makes them more likely to commit crime. Um, but yes, no, we're all, we're all feeling um, uh, an element of incarceration in our lives right now. Andrew Nielsen, thank you so much for uh, accepting my invitation for an interview for the show. I, I learned a lot because I'm not uh, an expert and this is not an issue that I know very well. Uh, I hope that uh, not only the government in Britain, but uh, uh, all over the world, uh, governments take the issues that have to do with COVID-19 and prisons 
very seriously. And uh, I hope that we will be able uh, to meet at some point uh, face to face when all of this is done uh, and we are also free. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.